Should you hold on for the long term? Depends who you ask. It's a well-known fact that there are cycles to investing and without any level of sophistication and knowledge about the subject, you would be hanging on to something that may very well be worthless at some point. Diversification is something we always hear, but 99.9% .9 of investors ignore. So what's the big deal about a buy and hold strategy anyway? You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we're going to talk about the buy and hold strategy. We're going to look at economic indicators, several of them. I want to talk about the Federal Reserve and interest rates and so much more. Let's begin by taking a look at this. Michael Lebowitz had this to say. When this market does break, you may be waiting a long time to get your money back. Ignoring history, risk levels, and valuations has its consequences. The inflation adjusted S&P 500 time to recapture losses. In this previous instance here, you saw 14 years in order to get your money back. 14 years. That's inflation adjusted using the CPI, I'm sure, not the real inflation. So actually, it's much worse. But you could see that there have been previous instances of 24 years, 29 years after the uh, 1929 issue here, and looking at 22 years before that. It could take a very long time to get your money back. And in all of that period, if it was, let's say, $100,000, you were stuck holding on to that money in those particular stocks and investments, whether they were making dividends or not. Perhaps if they were making dividends, you had a little bit of trickle of that income coming through, but that 100000 couldn't be used for other investments. So it's locked in there, unable to be used. I think that that's a big problem when you play the game of appreciation. So if you're going to make passive income along the way, that's one thing. You withstand the downturns, you wait for it to come back up, but throughout that period, if it's if it's a 25-year period, if it's a 14-year period, at least you've been making a paycheck every month, every quarter, whatever it happens to be. Total return, real return that is, of $1,000 investment with DCA, and that is dollar cost averaging. It's a different story for sure here. However, ultimately, it equates to the same thing. 13 years, 12 years, 15 years, and six years in these cases here. Long periods of time throughout. One of the things I wanted to note was that most of the time, the market moves up. You'll see that. The market is generally moving upward. However, there are periods of time when you lose out big time. You could see what happens. Short period of time, but the market tumbles very quickly. That's where people don't know what to do. There's this trigger event that sets it downward, downward spiral, and people don't really know what to do, so they hold on. And that's not a really good strategy to have. I think that we need to be cycle investors. If you want more information about the cycle investing, you could look at number one, Mike Maloney's work. He talks about it a lot. Robert Prechter talks about it in his book, At the Crest of the Tidal Wave. And uh, you know, there's, there's more about that through there. Now, I want to get into a whole bunch of different issues here. Buy and hold versus risk management and retirement goals. You can see that you know, you're moving into a time frame where you're going to have a fixed income at a certain point and you want to be able to maintain a certain level of passive income as you're going through this. You want to have that to pay off your bills, to pay off uh, you know, as uh, living expenses increase. But it's a problem. Look at this. Required value at retirement to support a 3% withdrawal. $5 million. Okay, going back here, the chart shows us uh, basically from 1988, the portfolio and how it would need to rise $5 million and real total return plus DCA, 625 monthly, basically the buy and hold, and it's not even close, $1.7 million. We've got an issue for the average person who's been putting money into these 401ks, the retirement funds, they have mutual funds and you know all these different types of 
funds which have been, they've been told they'll be able to survive further into the future. They're going to have money to leave their children and everything, but it doesn't ever work like that. This is showing us very clearly why that problem is. is because they have these expectations of consistent growth. That's never the way it is. Never. Real disposable incomes fail to support the cost of living. Obviously, I've covered this many times. Look at this. You can see this right here, consumer credit per capita. You know, I don't know about you. Everything that I buy is increasing in price. Here in Canada, internet and cell phones have become more expensive over the past, I would say, five years or so. It's supposed to be going down, but it's actually going up. And there are no real alternatives here. Of course, we have these monopolies that exist in that. That's a problem as well. But things are supposed to be going down. Something like technology in this case, you would think, would be a, something that's reducing in price, but it's not. In some cases it is, but, but not for, uh, I could tell you right now, cell phone plans. That's for sure. In Europe, the prices are ridiculously cheap. I can tell you that for sure. Okay, and then basically this right here is the gap between the real DPI and the cost of living. Just look at how much we have been, let's say, we've been getting the short end of the stick. We're not keeping up with inflation. Okay, The average person just doesn't. And then they get into retirement mode and they're thinking, wait a second, I was told that I'm going to have enough money, but there's a recession. What What is this all about? I don't know anything about a recession. And now suddenly my money is not worth that much. You telling me I got to go back to work? Well, my, my you know, this issue and that issue, I can't do it. That's the case for so many people today. Imagine when we hit the next recession. Participation in employer-sponsored retirement plans rises with age. More than two-thirds of millennials have no plan. Look at this. Unbelievable. Now, do you expect somebody who's, let's say, 20, 25 years old to have a retirement plan? Not necessarily, but you have to be preparing in some way, saving money in an account, at least. Not just spending all your money. You need to be saving. You need to be doing something with it. I mean, in fact, if you're a teenager or, you know, let's say you haven't really got into the workforce after your education is over and uh, there's a lot of opportunities for you, trust me. I'll be talking about that on my new channel when it comes up. But look at this for now. As you can see, these people don't have anything ready to go. There's nothing ready. I actually had my first investment, I'll tell you right now. My first investment was a mutual fund at a bank that, of course, I didn't know at the time. I was 14 years old. But they told me it would be good. And actually, it did increase in value. Uh, but I sold that off and bought gold with it. But uh, looking at it, at a, you know, in hindsight, at least I had, you know, I, I thought, wow, if I put my money in here, I was brainwashed. If I put my money in here, then it will be worth more later. And actually, in this case, it was, admittedly. However, I didn't know any other ways to use my money. So that's what I did. So you need to put your money somewhere. Somewhere, definitely. Don't just spend it. That's all. That's my message. Weekly flows into global technology sector funds. Unbelievable how much money has just flown in the tech stocks. I thought it was bad before. Actually, it's gotten a lot worse. The new statistics have shown us this concentration has actually been made even worse. And that's frightening. It's not a good thing. Hopefully, this is the one... I want to get to another point. Let me just cover this. Technically overweight tech weightings in several MSCI indexes, looking, you know, China, Asia Pacific, and the US topping everything 20%, 25%, and higher. Massive overweighting in the tech sector for these stocks. I read statistically that the gains that have been experienced in May, I think it was May. 75% of those gains came from the FANG Plus stocks, tech stocks, basically. 
75% of the S&P's gains from a handful of stocks. Unbelievable. That's a disaster waiting to happen. Now, for the person who said, well, I'm invested in FANG stocks. That's all I own. So I don't need to worry. Well, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Global sectoral indebtedness. Look around. This is basically comparing from 97, 2007, 2016, 2017, how debt has increased in this period of time. Governments have largely been increasing the amount of debt that they have right now. Hey, who cares, right? What about your typical corporations? Unbelievable as well. Households, surely they've increased. Financial sector has increased as well. They've claimed that there's been a deleveraging, but I don't see it anywhere. Emerging market debt maturity profile. I definitely wanted to mention this after this just because of the fact that we have encountered right now through 2018 into 2020, we got record amounts right now, trillions and trillions of dollars worth of debt that has to mature. When it matures, who's going to be the buyer? Are they going to monetize it? What's going to happen? That's the big question. Nearly half of investment grade companies are rated BBB. We're talking about what is supposed to be safe and you know this sought after investment is actually not even as far as i'm concerned investment grade we're talking about nothing but risky business okay risky business and then last but not least this is important to know because the Federal Reserve, actually at the time you watch this video, this may have already happened. The Federal Reserve is apparently going to increase interest rates yet again. Now, it's a problem, not just for all the reasons I've always covered, but this issue too, which I've touched on many times, but I don't focus on it, is that the yield is giving us a problem. Let me, let me get to the article. The yield curve last week was inverted in 2007, just before the recession. It also inverted in 2000. Now, the new chair has a little bit of a problem right here. We've got this issue. Now, as it explains in this article right here, there is no problem with the yield, like as if the yield curve inverts and all of a sudden there's a recession. That's not the case. All right. The Fed can't hold off rate increases it thinks are necessary just because of what the yield curve is doing. That risks falling behind and then rising, raising interest rates even more aggressively later and making the yield curve invert even more. So at the time that this rate increase happens, we're going to have to listen to the messages of Mr. Powell and see what he has to say. Many policymakers believe the low levels of long-term rates around the world now are residual effects of central bank bond buying programs rather than rate expectations. Higher rates in the U.S. have made treasuries attractive to foreign buyers, keeping rates low. The manipulation of all of these markets has caused a dislocation in between the facts and what we see. In between reality and what we're presented with okay the yield curve isn't the cause of recession so much as the result of the fed trying to keep the economy from overheating that's the problem that's what happens so we can see that the stock market starts rising everything starts getting heated we see this huge rise that's taking place Market's getting hot, so the Federal Reserve responds by starting to inch up these rates higher and higher, and then it gets to a point where, uh-oh, we've got a problem, and then the market tumbles down. These recessions happen because of the liquidity, which is either pumped out or dried up by central banks. We got some 
fun stuff on our hands. I will definitely do a video, a video about it tomorrow. If you found this video informative, please give me a thumbs up. When you give me a thumbs up, it helps to support this channel. I do appreciate that very much. And if you want the financial education you were not taught in school, then these two books have it all. When you go through these books, you get the information that is literally kept from you on purpose. They don't want you to know how to deal with your money. They want you to be ignorant. They want you to go through kindergarten all the way up through post-secondary education, not learning a damn useful thing. But what I did was I took everything I've learned, I've squeezed it down into these two books, and I know based on what I've heard from so many people that these will be beneficial for you. So if you want to check them out, you can do so in the link in the description, bring it over to Amazon. If you want the audiobook version of Global Economic Collapse, you can do that on my website. Take a look in the links in the description. Take care.